Hey guys, so two days ago I got my Roly Seaward Rise 49. I've been very happy playing around with it. Um, it. It was really enjoyable actually and setting it up was quite easy as well. Today I want to make a tutorial on how to use it in Logic and how to handle all the data. So before I'm actually going to show you examples, I want to have a little bit of talk about how these sort of MIDI controllers work because I think it's important, especially for a complex controller like this. So basically we have two two different types of MIDI controllers. We have the regular MIDI controllers, the ones you're used to with the pitch wheel and the mod wheel and the velocity and the blah blah blah. And we have the MPE controllers, the multi-polyphonic expression controllers. Now of those, um, we have roughly two different types as well. There's um, USB or MIDI controllers and there's OSC controllers. OSC is a standard that's not being supported by every synth. It's basically a network protocol and it's able of uh, sending like super many messages in a very short amount of time because it uses your network interface. This is how things like touch OSC work to sort of communicate with iPads and stuff like that. Now, um, Roly, they've decided to make this a regular MIDI controller. And I think that's smart because because of that, it can work with any synth that you can find because any synth can accept MIDI. However, there is a problem with MIDI, which is the limited sort of data range. And um, MIDI, because it was like originally from the 70s it's a super old standard um, it can only send up to um 128 different values and um, that has to do with the seven bit nature now there's one exception here which we'll get to in a minute um, so what this means for us as sort of end user is that um, some things are not going to have the, the sort of data range that you want. And to solve this problem, what Roly did is they sent new messages on new channels so that we're using a lot of MIDI channels in total to sort of um, collect our data. Now, um, a lot of people, when they sort of have MIDI controllers, it will work right out of the box. And that makes you think, okay, the, I'm good to go, I can make music. And um, mostly that is true. However, when you're running into a problem or when things go wrong or when you want to achieve a certain thing and you don't know how these messages actually translate, uh, that becomes more of a problem, it becomes more difficult to figure out what's happening. So the first thing, uh, my first piece of advice for today is getting a grip on the messages that controllers send, specifically with these MPE controllers. And to do that, I have this software here which is called MIDI monitor and that's exactly what it does it monitors the MIDI and you can see here I have my MIDI sources and those are all my MIDI inputs um, including my seaboard rice and what this will do is it will track the notes that I'm playing so if I just um, in logic mute my channel for now um, da -da, and then get my MIDI monitor then when I uh, press a few keys on the seaboard we can see all the messages that it's sending and we can see indeed that it sends this on different channels. So we have channel 14, channel 5, channel 10, um, 13. And the reason it does this is so that it's truly polyphonic. So that if you hold a note and you want to have pitch bend on one note um, and I mean, if you hold a chord, let's say you're holding a three note chord, um, C, E flat and G, and you want more uh, pitch bend on E flat. If it sends it on one channel, you're going to get that pitch bend for every every note, not only that E flat note. Um, but if they use different channels to send different notes, then um, we can we can do independent sort of control over each of the notes. And this takes a little bit of a special approach to work with in Logic, which is what I'm going to show you today. So a bit of a long introduction, but let's let's get to that. I'm gonna play a um, just a short piece. Like I said, I only have this for a couple of days, so my performing is really not um, up to the standard yet, but that's actually good because then we can look into how to edit it. So I'm just gonna go into record mode.
Okay, that was truly horrible. Um, what you could hear a lot in there is that um, because I'm not really used to the to the cure, I'm I'm more of a piano player, so um, I have some adapting to do. But what I heard is that some notes they're really um, I, I play them really too much out of tune. So um, let's actually see what we have recorded. So in this mini region, we can see, of course, our notes right there. Um, you can see that it's very sensitive to velocity as well, which is another thing I need to practice. Um, but if we open the automation, we can also see all the different messages that it has sent. And it's a shitload of messages. So we get for multiple channels or uh, brightness, which is just a CC message. We get our velocity, we get our pitch band, and we get our channel pressure. Um, channel pressure, by the way, is different from polyphonic aftertouch, um, and it's more supported. So it's good that this is actually uh, recording channel pressure right now. So um, let's let's find a, a region here, an area where we made a little mistake. And I believe we had something pretty horrible here at the beginning. Okay. Let's take that one as an example. The uh, let's see, I think it's that might be this F. Okay, so um, to work with all this data, it can be quite difficult to sort of go into your list and figure out which pitch band is causing the um, causing the pitch change because basically you have to select them all. Um, it's probably this one, by the way. And you have to sort of go through the list and uh, sort of check which one is off. Now, a way better way to do that is to actually open your event list, which um, I've mapped to the key command E. Um, but you can also go to window and then open uh, open event list, uh, command 7. Or you can go to your list editors here, which you can open up and then go to event so here you can see all the messages that it has sent and um, if it's not showing you anything you probably need to go to view and then link and then content um, if this is set to off then it's it's not going to show the region that you've selected but if it's set to content um, it's going to follow the selection in the arrangement window so now if i select another midi region um, I'm going to see the content of that, like that one, for example. So right now it follows everything that I select here. So let's take a look at our uh, original region and um, let's enable this catch play hat, which I've also mapped to a key command, which is that little squiggly thing. I don't know what it's called. Um, if I press that, it means that um, this yellow line that we see is going to scroll through the region as we play it. And that way you can keep track of where it is and you can see where that message is at the moment. So here, let's follow that. Um, so here somewhere was our, our nasty sort of pitch band message. Now. Um, Another way that this, this list can make your life easier is because you can um, filter different messages out. So I can click on notes, for example, program change, uh, system exclusive. I can um, disable all of those and only leave the pitch band active. So now all we're seeing is pitch band messages. Um, alternatively, I could click notes and then all I'm seeing is many notes, which are only 23. So um, with this, what you can do is you can find the node that, that has sort of the wrong data. You can select that node and you can see that it's on channel 3. That means that the pitch band for this node, which uh, happens to be a G sharp, um, or I would call it an A flat actually. Now, the pitch band for this would also be on channel three. So um, we can already see it here at the bottom, but that is a way to very quickly find the, the sort of CC messages that correspond to a note. So for example, if I select this G right here, I can see that my G is on channel seven. And then in my pitch band, I can go to channel seven and I can find the pitch band just for that note. Um, but right now we were on, on channel four, I believe. Um, let's try that again. So we select our note. Um, I 
that one. It was on channel three. And from here, we can very easily sort of fix our pitch band. So I could do something like this to just draw a straight line. And we fix that. Now, um, there's another sort of culprit here with the, this MIDI data, which is that um, we're, we only ever see it go down to like minus one or plus one, but still it sounds very out of tune. So this is, um, remember in the introduction where I said, I'm gonna get back to that. Um, this is where that is. What the problem is, or the difficulty with pitch band is that it's actually not a seven bit message. It's a 14 bit message, which sounds very technical, but basically it means that it can send more information than um, the, the standard 128 values. And this is what you see in, if you're, for example, ever worked in Ableton and you do a pitch band there, you'll see that if you, if you draw the pitch band, it goes up to a much higher value than um, this 63 in Logic. It goes up into the thousands um, and down as well. So here in Logic, they try to sort of make a uniform standard. So they, they sort of scaled those actual values down to something that we're used to, which is a range of 128. However, on the background, there's a lot more happening. So what you see here with these points, if I set it to four, that's not actually a value of four. This is just a sort of, um, yeah, sort of global, um, overview of what is actually happening on the background and inside your list editor if I take it again we can actually see the actual values so let's go to pitch band and let's select this note here and make sure this follows the selection um, we can see here that um, these values at the end here, that is the actual value, the length slash info category. So you can see that it can go up to um, 8,000. And with this, you can get a lot more precise. You can see that if you drag this down, the other one still stays at 62 um, with all those values in between. So um, if you want to get more precise editing over your pitch bands, you can use this list right here. And um, another handy tool which you can use there is if you take your uh, the, the, the marquee tool. Where is that guy? Uh, let's actually, oh, that one there. So with this, you can select a whole range of nodes and then you can um, you can edit those all at once and you can again see them in the list as well um so with with this tool it becomes a lot more sort of precise to to edit those messages um so that's that's actually what i did for uh for this track and i um i'm pretty happy with the results like this was my first time ever playing with the the seaboard i recorded this thing um which I think sounds pretty nice. It, it's a little bit off, but um, I really love the expression that I was getting out of that. So I hope that gives you a little bit of an overview of how to work with um, work with this sort of new fancy controller. Um, I'm gonna have some more videos about it, also showing how to work with specific synths that are not necessarily MPE uh, compatible. And I'm gonna um, show some things with Equator as well, which is the synth from Rolly. So that being said, I'm just gonna play this a little bit for you so you can get an idea of the sound and then um, I'm gonna see you in the next video.